I'm going to speak to you on the subject, hope and holiness. Now, I've got so much that I want to say to you today that if I were to try to finish this message all at once, we would be here for quite some time. I understand as a pastor, I've only got your attention for so long, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hit as much as I possibly can, and then I'll end it, and then, Lord willing, unless he comes and takes us home, we'll go back into these verses and continue this message. Don't know how long it will go, but I know that today will be the first part of it. And um, again, I'm going to have to end at a certain point and then come back in and finish it. So be patient with me as we go through these scriptures. They're extremely powerful. They're extremely life-changing, and I really believe that they'll speak to you as they have spoken to me this week. This week has been another week of crying out to the Lord, watching this world and what's happening to it. I'm sure that you've never experienced frustration, apprehension, or anything like that when it comes to what's going on. Um, but there has been a real battle for me, even though I have a biblical worldview and I see God bringing everything to an end, it's still upsetting when you see what's going on. And so, just crying out to the Lord, it was one of those moments, and I was talking to my brother, we were just saying, God, we know that we're tired, we're exhausted, because that's what happens at the end of the race. The church, the race is almost over, it's almost done. Jesus is coming. There's no doubt in my mind what we're watching across the world, of course, just reminds us of eschatology and the prophecy that's filled, and Scripture's filled with it, that tells us what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and we're watching it. And so I'm just crying out and saying, God, I just need a fill-up. I just need an encouraging word. I just need you to really speak to me. And just uh, want God to just show me who he is. I know I'm supposed to walk by faith and not by how I feel, but it was one of those moments this week where I just said, okay, God, I just, I just need you to touch me. Anybody ever been there? Okay, good. I don't, I don't feel so bad then. I just needed the Lord to just really touch me. So I'm studying, I'm praying, and um, of course going through the Bible like I would normally would do, and just arrested by these verses. And as I go into this and explain this to you, hopefully you've brought your Bible, you've brought a pen, you've brought a piece of paper, you're going to want to take notes because there's going to be a lot of information that I give you, but in this information, it is so powerful again, and I've said that already, but it's going to speak volumes to you as it did again to me. First Peter chapter 1, I'm going to start with verse 13. I'm going to read this in the King James Version. Whatever you have is totally fine. Peter's writing here says, Wherefore, gird up. Remember, wherefore always points back. Anytime you see therefore or wherefore, you've got to go back to what has been written because then it explains what's about ready to be written. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Amen. And if you call on the Father who, without respect of persons, judges according to every man's work, Pass the time of your journey here on this earth in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now, I want you to go back to verse 13, because we're not going to get out of this verse. So let's read it again, and then again in the next 
few weeks, we'll cover the rest of this. Verse 13 again. Wherefore, because of what I've just said, what I've just told you, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and this is the word that God gave me, and I'm going to unfold this one because this is what spoke to my own heart this past week, and again, it will speak to yours. Hope to the end. I want you to underline that. Hope to the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. May God add to the reading of his word. So let's dig into this, and let me do a little bit of teaching here today. Stay with me. Let me build it, and then we'll finally get to the conclusion towards the end of my message. When we come to verse 13 of our text, there's a major shift in Peter's writings. From verse 1 to verse 12, Peter is using verbs that are in what is called the indicative mode. This means that the verbs that Peter is using are literal statements of facts. That's what that means. He then switches it in our text by using verbs that are in the imperative. This means that Peter is using words that are direct commands. So from verse 1 to 12, he's using verbs that are in the indicative mode. These are statements of facts. By the time we get to verse 13, now he's going to switch the verb usage to imperative, and now he's going to begin to make commands. Now he begins these statement of facts, and you can start there in verse 2, where he tells us, and this is a statement of fact, that we are the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He goes on and he says, and again a statement of fact, that we've been born again, By the grace and mercy of God, because he raised him from the dead. You'll find that in verse 3. He gets to verse 4 and he tells us, We have a statement of fact, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for us. That's a statement of fact. Verse 5, he tells us, this is a fact That you and I, church, believers in Christ, we are being kept by the power of God. Again, Paul is using the verbs that gives us the statement of fact. And he begins to reveal just a piece of the depth and the wonder of our salvation. Now Peter shifts from these statements of facts and he now begins to give us commands. Now I want you to tuck this away Because this is important. This is where God really hit me this week as I was studying and putting this together. These commands, listen to the statement, are given because of the statements of fact. I'm going to say that again because this is going to set everything up. These commands are given to us as believers because of the statements of facts that Peter has just told us about in the previous verses. So Peter is telling us, here is what we are given, church, as the gift of salvation. And then what he begins to say as he switches his wordings, he's saying, now this is what God commands. This is what you've been given. Now I'm going to switch it. Now this is what God commands. Are you catching this? Now, Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, when he said, Too much is given, what church? Much is required. Now, I want you to hear this for a moment and tuck this away in your spirit. There is no greater gift that could ever be given than the Son of God. There is no greater gift. Oh, somebody ought to say amen to that more than just four or five. There is no greater gift, church. And since there is no greater gift that could ever be given, then no other gift could ever demand a greater response. And that's what Peter is doing. He's saying, okay, this is the gift that was given to you. Now this gift demands a response. In other words, listen, the greatest gift carries with it the greatest obligation. Now, you would think that Peter now, having now put this in a place where we could understand it, 
We see that all that we've received with this wonderful gift of salvation, Peter explains just a piece of it. Now he's going to turn it and say, okay, now that you've been given this, here's the commands of God. You would think that he would say anything else but what he's about ready to say. And this really rocked my world. Now, I want you to write this word down. It's part of the title of the message, and it's the word hope. This is the first command. I have no clue what's going on, but obviously the enemy doesn't want you to hear this. So we're just going to keep going. Now, what is this hope that we are commanded to live within? If I'm to set my hope, fix my hope, hope to the end, what is that kind of hope that Peter is talking about? Well, scripturally, the word hope means a confident expectation. It is a firm assurance about things, listen, that are unseen and still to take place in the future. Now, Hebrews 11.1, which is the biblical definition of faith, tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for. That word, again, means confidently expected. So in the simplest of terms, hope to the Christian is a confident expectation when it comes to what God says will take place in the future according to his word. Is this still sounding okay back there, Dan? Boy, I see the sound men scrambling. Come on, let's give our sound man an immediate hand. Thank you, guys. I so appreciate all that they do. If you take it deeper, you find that hope really, in the fullest sense, is the same as faith. It is believing God. It believes that everything God says, He will do. Everything that God says is coming will happen. But there's a slight difference between hope and faith. Now, I want to explain this, tuck this away, because I think Again, this really explains so much of what's going on in our own hearts and minds. Faith is believing and trusting God for the present. Hope is believing and trusting God for the future. In other words, faith believes what God has done. Hope believes what God has promised to do. One writer put it this way, faith accepts and hope accepts expects. I hope you caught that. In other words, church, again, faith believes what God has done. Hope believes what God has promised to do. Now, listen to what Peter is saying. Again, he lays out everything that God has done, what God is doing for us, and he then gives us a a command. And he said, church, because of what God has done, Because of what God is doing in your life. And this is the word that really I want you to get a hold of. Peter says, now fix your hope. Set your hope. Have a confident expectation that what God said that he was going to do, he is going to do. That was the command that Peter gave to us as believers. To believe God in such a way that there is an anticipation, an expectation that God will gloriously fulfill every single word he has spoken. Now, why is this so important, church? Why do we need to get a hold of this? I think anybody that has a biblical worldview sees things for how they really are. We're not blinded by the world. We're not caught up in the lies of the world. We don't live like the world. We're separate from the world as the Bible tells us to be. But at the same time, there's a whole lot of things that are happening that, again, are unsettling. For me, it's exhausting, even depressing when you watch it. You know that for the unbeliever, they're filled with fear because the future is uncertain. And yet, because we're believers, God doesn't want to be filled, uh, want us to be filled with fear. He wants us to be filled with faith. 
power, love, a sound mind. Why? Because the future church with God is absolutely certain. I want to say that again. It's because the future is certain with God. It's not uncertain. It is certain. So Peter, knowing that God's people are going to have to go through some things, he commands us to put our hope right where it needs to be on God and his promises. So that when we find ourselves in times of being unsettled, when doubt and fear try to overwhelm us, when we're exhausted and depressed over what's happening in the world, God is commanding the church, listen, don't get caught up in the fear. Don't get caught up in the worry. Instead, listen, you fix your hope. He commands us to live with a confident expectation for what is coming. Church, I hope somebody's getting a hold of this here today. So you fix your hope on the return of Jesus Christ. We fix our hope on the resurrection from the dead. We set our hope on eternal life. These are things that God wants us to fix our hope on. Fix our hope on the final defeat and destination of our enemy, Satan. Don't lose hope because it looks like the enemy is winning. Instead, fix our hope on the fact that the enemy has already lost. That's just so powerful to me. And I felt God telling me just in such a powerful way, Jeff, get up. Stop with the pity party. Stop the woe is me. Anybody ever sing that song, Gloom, Despair? Come on, can you sing it? An agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. I have excessive misery. So God is like, get up. And in this word, I really felt the command of God, now fix your hope. Hope to the end. I was wonderful, church. Absolutely wonderful. Now, go back to verse 13 again. We're going to keep going back. In fixing our hope on God, what is it that we are to hope for? Now, again, I'm blown away by this. It says that we are to fix our hope, or we, we are to hope to the end for the grace being brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't say fix your hope on the revelation of Jesus. Don't fix your hope on the glorification of your bodies. Don't fix your hope on the enemy's defeat. Instead, fix your hope on the grace that is going to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, church, why grace? Why grace? Why are we to fix our hope on that? Let me tell you why. And here's what I'm getting as a pastor all the time. There are many believers today that just don't think that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for them. They're in a major place of struggle. They don't think that they're good enough. They don't think that they're doing enough. They're probably at the weakest that they've ever been, spiritually speaking. They beat themselves up. They wonder if they're even saved. Is my name even written in the Lamb's Book of Life? And it's almost like when I was growing up as a preacher's kid, I was taught of the coming of Christ. I believed that he could come at any moment. But I was always so discouraged because I could not live the life that I felt like God wanted me to live. I always failed. And here's my, my thought process. Well, maybe I could time his coming right. Where if he comes, then at that moment I'm doing what's good spiritually. Maybe I can time it in a way that I won't be missed or left behind. Anybody ever thought that? Man, I'm a weirdo. Anybody ever think, you know what, Pastor, I don't feel like I'm good enough. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Pastor, I, man, I haven't even had the strength to read my word. I, 
I don't want to pray. I, I'm just in the middle of a battle. I, I don't even know if God comes back. He's going to come for me. Why did he want us to hope for this grace? Church, I want to tell you why. Do we think that God owes us our final glory because of something we've done or something we are doing? Is that what we think? Do we think that these statements of facts that included this wonderful inheritance that's ours is going to be given because of our worthiness? Oh, you know where I'm going, don't you? Listen to me, church. When we first received the salvation of our souls, we didn't deserve it. Listen, we didn't earn it. We had no right to it. And I guarantee you, you were not worthy of it. It was purely a gift of grace. And it will not be any different in the day that Jesus comes to take us home. It will be God's grace, his unmerited blessing, and his undeserved kindness. You see, church, Peter's trying to tell us you can fix your hope because it's all about grace. You can set your hope and you can hope to the end, even in your place of failure or your place of weakness, even when you think you're struggling. You can fix your hope. You can set up because it's always been grace and it will always be grace. You can set your hope because no man can save himself. You can fix your hope because you cannot keep yourself saved. And you can hope to the end because no man can earn his future glorification. Somebody say amen to that. Church, we are no more worthy of what is coming to us in the future than what we have received from him when we were saved. And that is the truth. And so Peter is saying this, listen, regardless of what's going on, live in full anticipation of the fullness of grace. You set your hope on the grace that will come to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, church, what a command. What a message for the church today. What a command to the people of God. And we're not to wallow in hopelessness. Don't think that, the, that God has lost and the devil has won. No, hope to the end. Fix your hope on what is coming and live that hope out in everyday life. Oh, is anybody getting a hold of this one? What a message. If you're struggling today, here's what you do. Fix your hope. Because it's going to be God's grace that comes and takes you home. Just like it was his grace when he wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Now let me go on. Because you'd ask, well, Pastor, how do we fix our hope on this grace that is coming? Because it's very strange how Peter worded this verse. If you go back and look at verse 13 again you find two participles. Now, participles in the Greek always modify the main verb. And these two participles come at the first part of the verse. And what does Peter say first? He said, gird up the loins of your mind and what? Be sober. So here's two commands. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Now, let's take the first one, gird up the loins of your mind, and let's take it apart. What does that mean? Well, in Peter's day, when somebody would hear that word gird up, they would know exactly what Peter was trying to say. In those days, men would wear long flowing robes, and you've heard this before. And when they wanted to move, they were in a hurry, they wanted to run, they would tie that robe up. Uh, around their legs and their waist so their legs could move freely. So they would wear a sash, and they would take that sash off. They'd gather up all of the excess of that material in this robe. They would gather it up, and they would tie it with this sash. And then this way they could move quickly everywhere, anywhere they wanted to move. Now, in battle, the men would take that same sash, and they would tie it in a way where it would protect their private areas. 
Because they knew that in battle, if they were to get hit in the private area, they were done. They were lost. They would be killed. So they would take that sash and they would tie it in a way that would give them that extra protection. Now, Peter then adds a phrase. So he says, gird up the loins. So they would know that. Okay, I'm going to gird up my loins. This is the reproductive area. I'm going to gird it up. I'm going to protect it. But then he says, the loins of your mind. Now, what is the loins of the mind? What does that mean? Well, I want you to turn to James chapter 1, and that's to your left. And I want you to look at verse 12 to 15. James says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Listen, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath what? Conceived. It brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Now, church, I want you to catch that word conceived. Because what James is doing, what Peter is doing when he talks about girding up the loins of your mind, they're telling us that our minds are the womb for what is birthed in our lives. Now, I've covered this at length if you've been here any length of time uh, so just be patient with me if you've heard this, but for those that have never heard it, you need to hear it. Your mind is the womb for what's going to happen in your life. Now, we know that because the Bible tells us that as a man thinks, so is he. That it's from the heart, the mind, that come the issues of what? Life. So now Peter, Paul tells us, that we are transformed, our minds are transformed when they are renewed. Our lives are transformed when our minds are renewed. In other words, a transformed mind equals a transformed life. And that's why I've said to you over and over again that your greatest battle is in your mind. It is the, it is the battlefield of the mind where we find our greatest battles. And church is in the mind where the enemy works. He comes and he plants a seed. And when that seed is conceived, that sin is conceived, when it's nourished by our thoughts, eventually that sin is birthed. And so Peter is saying, listen, if you're going to live with this hope to the end, Here's what we're going to have to do, church. We'll have to gird up the loins of our minds. That just as the loins of the male is the reproductive area, so too is the mind. Just as you gird up your loins to protect you in battle, Peter says you've got to gird up the loins of your mind. That's the womb of your life. And he's saying, listen, you've got to tie up that reproductive area of your mind. So when the enemy plants those seeds of sin and doubt and unbelief, you're able to take those thoughts into captivity. You don't sit there and nourish the thought so that one day it's birth. No, you bring it into captivity. You cast it down. You say, no, you cannot stay up here and then produce something that's going to destroy my life. I'm not going to let the enemy do that, church, because I'm going to gird up the loins of my mind. So when the enemy comes in and tempts and distracts us, when he tries to get us, get us tangled up with the, the things and the affairs of this world, because we've girded up the loins of our mind, we can keep our priorities right. Because he's, we've girded up the loins of our mind, we can do what is right. We're not going to let our thoughts and our purposes and our decisions just hang loose and blow with the breeze. We've got to tie it down. Are you hearing this, church? That's what Peter is commanding us to do. He said, now listen to me. You cannot let these things go on in your mind. 
You can't let this stuff replay in your mind. You can't pull up a seat, grab a bowl of popcorn, and keep replaying these things. Men and women, listen, the enemy wants nothing than to tempt us in the mind with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. That's what he's trying to do, to make us incubate that, to make it to where one day, not only is it conceived, but it is then birthed into real life. And church, that's what's going on here. And Peter's commanding us, now listen to me, you've got to watch your mind. You've got to understand that it's the battlefield of your life. Now you need to gird that thing up and make sure things are right in the mind. Is this making sense, church? Amen. Now, but then he goes on. Look at the second participle. We are to be sober. Now, when we hear this word, immediately we think of drunkenness and rightly so. The Bible is very clear that the drunkard will never inherit the kingdom of God. But there's another thought here, and that is this. Listen to me. It's to be intoxicated by the world. To be intoxicated by the world. To get so caught up with what the world is doing. So caught up in what the world believes and how the world behaves. That we allow the flesh to dominate our lives that we get intoxicated by what the world is offering us. So we end up going in hook, line, and singer, sinker. So Peter is commanding us, now listen, you're going to have to be sober. Don't get entangled in this world. Like Paul was talking to Timothy, listen, don't get caught up in the affairs of this world. Listen, you're a soldier of Jesus Christ. We can't get distracted we can't get entangled with everything that's going on. And, man, that was a word directly for me, that if I'm to fix my hope or hope to the end, then I can't get intoxicated by what's going on. I can't get caught up in the things of this world. I'm going to have to be sober and separate myself from all of it. I love what Titus said. Would you turn to Titus? Chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. I'm almost done. Because the next part will take just as long. Listen to this. For the grace, starting in verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. What does grace teach us? That we deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world while we look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. No wonder God talks about separation from this world. No wonder he tells us, don't love this world. Don't love the things that are in this world. All that stuff, church, will one day pass away. But he said this, and this is 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17. It's that one that does the will of, of the God that abides forever. The church, listen. What Peter's commanding us, I think, is so relevant for our day. While everybody gets weaker spiritually and compromises, Peter's commanding the church, listen, you're going to have to have a sober mindset when it comes to this world. Don't compromise. Don't live our lives their way. That's the wide path. Let's live our lives on the narrow path. Church is that important. It is that important. We've got to have to have to live with a spiritual steadfastness. We're going to have to live knowing that we're just passing through. Like the saints of old, we're looking for the city whose builder and maker is God. To live with a spiritual self-control. It's a spiritual disciplined life. To live like a true disciple of Christ. And as we do, here's what God's commanding us, hope to the end. I want to conclude with this. I felt like this was 
what God was just really challenging me with. To never lose hope. It doesn't matter what situation that you're in. It doesn't matter if it looks impossible. It doesn't matter if you can't figure out how God is going to bring you through or what God is going to do. It's saying, all right, God, I believe that you are who you say that you are and that you can do what you say that you can do. And because of it, I'm going to hope for the answer of prayer. I'm going to hope that you're going to bring me through. And remember, that word is not what we think it is in English. Let's, let's look at it in Scripture. It's a confident expectation. I confidently expect God to be with me. I confidently expect God never to leave me nor forsake me. I confidently expect God never to give me more than what I can handle. I confidently expect God to work all things out together for my good. I confidently expect God to end the rule and reign of the wicked. I confidently expect God to come for me because it's grace. It's always been about grace and never about what we are doing. It's all about what Jesus has already done. And because of that, church, I can confidently expect the promises that God gave to his son, yea and amen. And that's the message I felt God wanted us to hear today. That whoever's here and you're in a hopeless situation, hopelessness has overcome and overtaken you, here's the command. God gave you the greatest gift of all. Now God commands you to hope to the end.